How do you answer an extract to whole question? This is an example of how to do that based on A Christmas Carol. The question, starting with this extract, explore how far Dickens presents Christmas as a joyful time. The first thing that you need to do is to read that question incredibly carefully and determine what it's asking you. And the key in this particular question is the phrase, how far? Because this is a, an opportunity to evaluate. Do we agree that Christmas is always a joyful time? Well, the answer to this is likely to be somewhat. It's broadly speaking joyful for all the other characters other than Scrooge, and it's joyful in the extract, as we will see in a few moments. But Christmas is not necessarily joyful all of the time for all of the characters. The next thing that you're trying to do is to read the top part of the text quite carefully and ensure that you know whereabouts in the text this information is being taken from. We are told that it's from chapter 2, should say stave 2, and hopefully that gets you thinking, ah, that's the ghost of Christmas past. You're then told it's the ghost of Christmas past and he has taken Scrooge to the place where he used to work. So we know that at this stage, Scrooge has already been to see his childlike self. We have already learned that he was abandoned as that child. We already know that he knows love to some degree because he is sort of rescued from the, the misery of his school days by his sister, Little Fan. These are pieces of information that we bring to the table. Then, as we're reading the extract, what we're trying to do is not write about every little single detail that's in the passage provided, but use the best of the details to springboard into the wider text. So for the purposes of this, I'm just going to demonstrate this via the first five, six lines, there or thereabouts. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Right, now as you're looking at the extract, you're trying to focus on the springboard details. And in A Christmas Carol, the key to remembering, or the key to success, I think, is to remember that virtually all of the questions, whether we, whether we think them to be about Scrooge or not, this one says it's about Christmas as a joyful time, they're all about Scrooge. So while we are shown Fezziwig, the role of Fezziwig is to contrast that of Scrooge. How does he contrast Scrooge? His name, Fezziwig, it sounds joyful and silly, which is in contrast to the harsh sounding nature of a word like Scrooge. But we're not just trying to look at differences because the most successful students will identify similarities so that differences can be teased out. Let me give you an example. Fezziwig, with his silly name, he looks up at the clock which is pointing to the hour of 7. 7 p.m. is a late hour to still be working. We know earlier in the text that Scrooge insists that Bob Cratchit work phenomenally hard. And therefore, there is a similarity in their characters in so much as they are evidently both successful men, at least in terms of wealth, because they work hard. They expect a lot of themselves and they expect a lot of others. But this is where the differences can be teased out. Because Fezziwig rubs his hands and he adjusts his capacious waistcoat. He laughs all over himself. He has a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. The key to success, I believe, is to not treat a word like capacious as separate to his voice. What you need to try and do is bring them together. Capacious 
is what you might call a portmanteau, it's a blend. It, it seems to come from the word capacity and spacious. It suggests that he, it's large. To put it bluntly, Fezziwig is fat, he's rotund, he's round. And you're not going to be round in Victorian London unless you're wealthy. Both Scrooge and Fezziwig are wealthy. But where Scrooge is spindly and thin, Fezziwig appears to enjoy his wealth. And we see how he enjoys his wealth through his voice. His voice is a symbol of this. Because it's not just, a, you know, a, a nice voice. Dickens uses the list. Oily, rich, fat, jovial. And each of these words combined creates an idea of splendour, really. It's, it's opulent, oily food, rich food, for instance. It, it makes you fat. Jovial means jolly. And so if we combine that with the word capacious and treat them as a, as a combined entity, then we can say something more interesting. So, he has a capacious waistcoat, which symbolises his wealth. And his generosity to himself. We know that he is a kind and warm-hearted man through the description of his voice. But we, this is reinforced still further. It is accentuated by Yo-Ho there, Ebenezer and Dick. Yo-Ho makes him sound like some kind of Father Christmas, Santa Claus type figure. But perhaps more interestingly, and I think more subtly... Scrooge enters the room accompanied by his fellow Prentice. Fezziwig's wealth enables him to employ many people. Two apprentices, not one. It's a display of wealth, arguably, but it's a way of investing in the future. He isn't enclosed, he isn't keeping his money to himself. He is sharing his wealth. Now, I'm making subtle references to other parts of the text already. But if we're using this passage as a springboard into the wider text, and that's what we aim to do, what I want you to demonstrate as far as is possible is how. His capacious waistcoat combines to his oily, rich, fat and jovial voice. The word jovial connects to the use of yo-ho, which is a sort of demonstration of his Santa Claus-like quality. What does Santa Claus do? He gives gifts to, to all, because why not? That generosity of spirit is demonstrated in there being more than one apprentice. And this all contrasts to the way that Scrooge treats the character of Bob Cratchit. Bob Cratchit and his poor family who only have two tumblers and a custard cup as the family display of glass. Bob Cratchit and his family, who suffer uh, at the hands of the ogre, that is, Scrooge. And how do we know that Scrooge is an ogre? Because he only allows Bob Cratchit one coal on the fire. Now, whether we're able to remember the quotations from the earlier parts of the text, or the later parts of the text, it doesn't really matter, so long as we know or demonstrate that we know the details of what happens at other places in the text. That's the key. How far does Dickens present Christmas as a joyful time? Well, in this passage, the answer is a good deal. But early in the text, we see how Christmas is difficult, particularly in, in relation to Scrooge, who isolates himself away from Christmas. What's a perfect example of Scrooge uh, embodying Christmas's lack of joy? Well, when the charitable gentlemen uh, arrive to ask for some generosity of spirit, we can well imagine that Fezziwig here would give benevolently, whereas Scrooge says, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? And reinforces Dickens' message that Scrooge must reform as a character, because without reform, 
Christmas can never truly be a joyful time.